more like, what the f about that or the musicals. <laughs> What the hell is the matter with me, man? Yeah, hey, interview's over. I gotta go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like friendship over. Oh, man. I just ruined my career. Uh. There is one. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> what are you doing there? <laughs> Am I in the shot? Oh, even? yeah. No, you're there. <laughs> You are the shot. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? AJ Good here, not at the House of Masks. I'm actually with Don Draculich in his, what do you call this? It's a studio? Studio garage. Workspace? Yeah. yeah. Something like that. And today, we are doing the Don interview, not the sleazy interview. We're going to save that for another time. But Don's here. I'm excited. I hope that you guys are excited as well. I want to say thank you, first of all, for having me here. This is, uh, if you had told 16-year-old AJ, yeah. that I'd be sitting in your garage doing an interview with you. I would have been like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, in all actuality, thank you very much. I You're appreciate welcome, it. You're welcome, man. Uh, let's start this off right. I want to start, kind of set the uh, set the tone here. I want to ask a very general question. Maybe not even a question so much as a, a life story, essentially. Okay. For anyone that doesn't know, yeah. who is Don? Who's Don Draculich? Who is Don Draculich? Don Draculich was a... Uh... Child of the Northern Virginia, just like Dave Brocky, mm -hmm. um, although not exactly. I think his dad was uh, he was English, and his mom was his dad was Scottish. I think he was English, and uh, you know they moved down from Canada. But you know how Northern Virginia is full of a lot of people who who uh, <clears throat> come from someplace else. You know, it's a transient. It's a transient city in a way, um, because it's all part of that post World War II uh, industrial. It was a you know war complex that developed there. My parents were in the CIA. Really? Yeah. So they were both in the CIA, and so I was a CIA kid uh, who grew up in McLean, Virginia, and um, you know that was before we traveled around. We got stationed in a few overseas countries, and then we ended up finally. Dad became a. Uh, you know, permanently stationed in the States after being a field officer for quite a few years. And um, so I grew up in Northern Virginia, you know, was in, uh, influenced by the punk scene uh, as it was coming up at that time. Although I wasn't a punk. Dave used to say that. You're not. We're not even a real punk. It's like, so? Yeah. What does that mean? That's the <laughs> least punk cares? thing you can say. Who cares? If that had, that same thing happened to you when you were up in Northern Virginia, going to D.C., you got ostracized by frickin' Henry Rollins and Ian McKay. He hated those guys. That's kind of why we uh, have a guar. Dave Bronchi's, you know, being ostracized by the, mm -hmm. mm, the DC punk scene. But anyways, um, so I went to art school. Uh, first of all, I did terrible in high school, you know. Just, just did not focus like I needed to. Not dumb, just didn't focus and uh, develop bad work habits. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, really, I, I, I fantasized being an illustrator, filmmaker. I was like, I want to be George Lucas and Jack Kirby, you know? I was like, put the two together or something. I don't know what my plan was. But um, I went to uh, VCU uh, for my art degree, um, found out that being an illustrator, neither illustrator or filmmaker at VCU was really practical. Uh, if you want to be an illustrator, you get stuck in the commercial arts uh, department of the art school. And that's boring as shit. It's a lot of cutout and a lot of very strict, rigid design. You can't sit there and do, you know, Frank Frazetta paintings at will. Here's my... Uh, here's mm -hmm. my you, know, you can't. You, they're not interested in that. They want you to do an illustration like a dude smoking a cigarette or something like that. You know, it's stuff that's has commercial applications. Um, and uh, you can't be doing, you know, you can't be doing barbarian paintings in fine art. I, you can try. You can turn that crap in and get shredded, but you know. Your grade average is not is going to be low, and uh, the 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 abuse you'll take in crits, as we call them, 
uh, and during critique is going to be pretty hard. So, you know, most people drop that, learn to play the game. I learned to play the game. Uh, I wanted to stay figurative, you know, so that I could learn how to paint and do figurative stuff uh, so that when I transitioned, hopefully, over into, uh, you know, illustrational painting that I would I would have some skills so I learned the game I I finally figured it out I started taking uh, characters from uh, a uh, karate, practical karate manual it's called was called practical karate for women and and it's just a bunch of you know so all these paintings look like women beating the shit out of men which did well teachers loved it <laughs> Bernard Martin was trying to my last my last senior year artist. He was trying to talk me into staying with it and going pursuing post grad. So after I graduated from college, I floundered and I hung around in uh, in Richmond. And my I had a girlfriend. She did the same thing. Uh, I got a job delivering appliances, and um, I ran into well, I didn't run into. I'd known him. All through art school, but Mike Delaney also worked there, and Chuck Varga, his executioner, mm -hmm. also worked there. And they were going, "Hey, man, we got this thing going on at the dairy, you know, uh, working on this, 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 you know." Really, what they were excited about was working on this movie with Hunter Jackson, yeah. which was going to be Scum Dogs of the Universe. And so uh, I went over there and I uh, was checking things out, and then um, that was it. Was at that point also that they decided. David talked him into doing a, letting him wear costumes, some of the scum dogs of the universe costumes, uh, and open for themselves, mm -hmm. right? And so I made my first prop. It was for the P.B. Kelly show. Uh, it was this kind of scepter or something like that that uh, this character comes comes in wearing. I don't know if you've ever seen that whole P.B. Kelly's live show. This guy has some fireworks on his head, and he's mm -hmm. carrying the scepter. I learned my first lesson though that day. It's like you got to make your, you make a guar prop better be durable because mm -hmm. the thing was ruined before it got. It was when it got put into somebody's trunk. We had to fold it up, and it got ruined uh, just to make it fit. So, um, anyways, uh, that was fun, and so I I uh, broke up with my girlfriend, and I lost my job, and. Um, so I was short on cash, and so it just it fit well. I was like, oh, you can you can live in the dairy uh, for pay rent forty sixty bucks a month, right? So it's like nice. Yeah, I can sit there and just do day jobs. Mm -hmm. I can do temp work, and you know I only need two three temp work jobs a week for one week to you know live for the rest of the month. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it doesn't include food and other things, but. So I'd work more often than that, but still, it, it was it was uh, it was affordable and it was a lot of fun because there was just stuff going on, and um, so uh, I got more and more involved with Guar. By the time the Schaefer Court show happened, I'm like, and I built the I built the cockroach costume for mm -hmm. that, and um, I was thinking to myself, it's like, hey man, this could go somewhere. It's a lot of fun regardless. Um, I should stay with it. You know, I think I will stay with it, as a matter of fact. And so I just kept on going uh, from there. Um, things changed. Hunter left for a while. And then uh, I kind of took his roles, the kind of primary, one of the primary artists, you know. Um, and uh, Dave and I got real tight at that point. And, um, yeah, I guess that at least gives you a preliminary up until when I got into Guar, mm -hmm. and then, you know, after that, I don't know what else to say about myself. Okay, well, that, I think that actually leads off to a good point, because I think that there's a lot of uncredited behind-the-scenes um, Dawn work. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not wrong, and no, feel free to correct me. I'm ready right. to stamp my uh, name on whatever, uh, you, what do you, whatever you think I did. You were the first person to come up with the spew aspect of Guar. Yeah. And it was a ketchup bottle, arm rip? Uh, close. So, um, the first spew, if you call it that, yeah. 
Hunter would take uh, blood balloons and he'd tape them on one side of a mace. And then he hit somebody on the head with that mace and it goes yeah. all over, you know, him, that person, the actor. Mm -hmm. uh, that was cool. And then uh, Dave did a live show with Death Piggy where he opened for the Plasmatics. And so he was making fun of uh, Wendy O. Williams had just had a Playboy Playmate appearance. So there was some, there was nude photos of her. And so he thought it'd be funny to play Death Piggy, but... Uh, before they started the show, they had a little stupid pantomime, kind of a silhouette curtain behind it, like a puppet show. Mm -hmm. so the audience uh, just seen a shadow on the thing, and so he's holding up this magazine, and he's pretending to jack off to it while using... He had a ketchup bottle inside of a kind of a rubber hose with a dick sculpted on the end of it. And so uh, you saw the shadow puppet show of him you know, ejaculating all over the place. So yeah. that was the next step. And then uh, um, then it was like, I was thinking to myself, like, hey, how can we get the audience into this? Mm -hmm. How can we get, make the audience feel part of this, you know? We need it. And I was thinking in terms of, first of all, was what I was kind of bringing to the thing was I was the Fangoria kind of influence person. That was where I was coming from. You know, you think about the different members of Guar, what they were bringing to the table. And uh, Hunter... Hunter was uh, was very much the, the the Japanese manga anime sort of element he brought to Guar, and uh, for me, I was all about. I was, you know, even though we were very crude and we didn't know what we were doing, I wanted to bring that Hollywood effects kind of, you know, yeah. thing to Guar, and so <clears throat> I came up with this concept: this guy who gets his arm ripped off. He's supposed to be a stupid, you know, a stupid fan. I think we got him a, I found some stupid, like, one of those ridiculous kind of rock and roll looking red satin jackets that douchebag A&R guys often wear when they come to your show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they'll have the label on the back, you know. Hey, guys, really great media, you know. Hey, that was a great show there, Don. Hey, blah, blah, blah. you know, and that look like that. And um, so I found one of those in a thrift store and uh, carefully detached, you know, cut off the arm, and then I sewed a fake ganglia patch that was where the arm was, and um, so I, I ran a hose from, what I had, did was I hung a hot water bottle from underneath the arm. I hung on a hot water bottle, and I ran the hose to the other arm. And I, of course, I had my real arm was folded up under, underneath me, behind me, whatever, and the fake arm was there. And so it's just attached by Velcro, and it has a fake hand in there. And I, I go, hey, Dave, I really want to meet you. You're awesome. And then I <laughs> flung my dead arm up there, I like to shake it. Yeah. Dave grabs it to shake it, <laughs> and then of course he rips it off, you know. And I turn and I'm squirting my blood, and I squeeze it and I shoot it on the audience, right? And uh, my wasn't much range. It was just yeah. enough to get a couple people in, like, in the very front. Just yeah. a couple of... But the, uh, the, the idea was planted at that point. Right? Yeah. So next step was, hey, I'll do a decap. Right? And so I did the exact same thing. I had the hot water bottle and I had some, a fake foam head on top of some fake shoulders that I made out of foam. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was cool. Uh, it didn't work quite the way I wanted, but it doesn't matter. We were like, we got to keep going. Yeah. We want to do that decap again. And then Dave Muscle had another, you know, he did the, the next uh, breakthrough, and which was, why try to hide the blood? Audience doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Audience is like, you've been to a Guar show, unless you're like the front yeah. row, you can't see anything from the waist down. Yeah, it's it's like framed like a puppet show. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. It's framed like a puppet show, so or a Punch and Judy show. So nobody's going to see that hose anyways. And even if they do, they don't care. It just yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. And you get excited I, when you see them because yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you kind of, exactly, you know. That's, that's something that Hunter taught me and us in general was that the way the Japanese are about the way they do stuff, they don't care if it looks fake mm -hmm. because you're so compelled by the outrageousness of it, you know, that you, you buy into it anyway. You just throw yourself, it doesn't matter, you know, it's a, there's something that's that leap, you know. And so, yeah, we started, uh, so he said, let's, let's run a, 
was when let's run a ho you know run it from off stage with compressed extinguisher so we started stealing fire extinguishers from the vcu campus buildings perfect they were uh, all they were water filled and they have a um they have a bicycle or you know standard tire tire valve on the side mm -hmm. that you can fill with any kind of bike pump compressed air nozzle whatever right so we start stealing those you screw off the top you put your water and your blood into it blood mix it into it and then you screw it back up you pressurize it and you have those stored st safe stage side and you start um, yeah so we started blasting people that way and um, it just kept then just kept getting more complicated from there it was just like well why should we you know stupid we 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 sometimes we excuse me we'd uh, we take those extinguishers and we'd get them pressurized and didn't have quite get them seated quite right mm -hmm. and air would leak out and you'd sit there and okay decap wah, wah, yeah. wah, wah, no that pressure that still happens oh yeah it's true that's true but still you know happens. we we put our you know we bring our own we bring our own pressure mm -hmm. with us right we have a compressor and we got these big tanks and there's three of them it's like 250 gallons or some stuff like that it's like um but that's where it's that's where that basically you know that's where it started so there's a cumulative bunch of ideas one on top of another you know but um that that arm rip trying to get the audience involved you know and then as soon as we saw what happened with that yeah. it was just like and that that in a way has always been uh you know one of the signature elements of, of guar is that that audience participation of course that was the way it was when i was in the audience at pb kelly's right we all got it immediately half the people in the crowd i think became or involved with or worked with guar at some point or another right like you scan the pb kelly's uh, audience and that you see me you see scott wolf you see scott crawl you know all these people would become uh, members you know but we were all kowtowing to the band yeah. you know and treating them like they were gods and stuff like that because that's what the concept was the concept was you know people have a tendency to treat rock bands as if they're gods well what if a bunch of gods actually became a rock, rock band? band you know how would they behave what would that constant what would they what would that be like you know yeah. and that's where the humor comes from it's like you know you're all worthless and weak and they hate the human race mm -hmm. and stuff like that and, um and, you know it's it it like once you have a concept a joke like that it writes itself it's just it's easy yeah. you know it's easy to just keep going with that it's like so um yeah perfect who or i guess how was it decided who was going to take the reins on a project at the pit because I've recently discovered that there were items that you sculpted that I had no idea you were even involved with. Mm -hmm. So I guess how is it Don's going to sculpt this Jizmac mask or Hunter is going to do this or etc. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, it was it's it was competitive. Really? Yeah, it was competitive. There definitely some elbowing at the water trough there. Yeah. Um, uh, generally I had a little more pull than others because I was pretty much acknowledged as the best pure sculptor in the band. Um, but, um, at the same time, everybody has to contribute and they have to be involved. Uh, it's not just a matter of me sculpting something and throwing it to someone else and saying, here, you mold this, yeah. you know, or something like that. You know, you got other artists involved. They want to put their... You know two cents in worth and so they have to design they want to design stuff they want to actually sculpt stuff they want to concept stuff everybody does and so um and it, i was telling the story uh and i turned it into a quick hitter uh or at least uh, justin did uh, a few days ago last week it was about the world maggot mm -hmm. and you know the world maggot evolved by dave just he just would bring it up at and in, in uh interviews and you know you know how he is he's just stream of thought mm -hmm. absurd you know crazy ideas and uh he um so you know it's just during an interview what happens what are you trying to you know and he'd come up with this world maggot he probably am inspired by things like elric and uh you know um lord of the rings and things like that you know so it comes up with this thing and then 
So then we're kind of stuck. Once we once you said it more than a couple times, it becomes kind of the mythos, you know. So we're like, well, you know, how do we use that? And then of course you saw it appear in um, Skullhead Face. Mm -hmm. So we had a puppetized version of it, you know. It's supposed to be gigantic. And um, so uh, after that, we're like, well, you know, what can we do to incorporate, you know, some new monster or new element into the show? And um, I came up with the idea. Well, let's do, let's do a stage version of the World Maggot. And uh, I, I won't say which artist, uh, but man, he hated that idea. It's like, oh, it'll never work, and that's stupid, and this and that. And I was like, you know, I was convinced. Yeah, no, it'll work. Mm -hmm. um, it, will, it will definitely work. And I, I already had. It didn't take me long to visualize exactly how I'd go about making it. Um, and so it could it could get like that. The flesh column was a classic example of a lot of people trying to shoehorn in how to do that mm -hmm. thing. And as it turned out, we had an outsider come in, and it, we went with his overall his design, and it almost killed five people. Well, we made it basically a cage, right? We made a kind of a monkey. I'd say a little miniature monkey bar cage, basically, mm -hmm. you know, that we were going to strap all these people to. And uh, the arms were so big and heavy that we had to counterbalance them in the back. And then once we had all the people on it, that thing had gained like 600 pounds or something like that. And uh, I was the one who had arc welded the uh, casters on the cage at the bottom and um, just jump ahead. Those wheels almost broke off. The thing almost fell over and crushed mm -hmm. everybody in that thing. That'd have been the end of Guar right there. It had five gigantic lawsuits and who knows what else. You know, um, that would have been end. That'd have been end, end of us for sure. But anyways, um, so so really, as Dave described a long time ago in uh, a documentary that I still haven't released, <laughs> he called it a gladiatorial arena of artistic ideas. And um, sometimes you, you convince the others and sometimes you don't. Um, but when, when it was a likeness, for instance, a victim, generally they like to go with me as the go-to guy because I could, I could nail a likeness you know, of people pretty well. Yeah. And I was fast, too. That's another thing. Um, that costs money. Every day you pay somebody to sculpt a little bit long, as an, as another hundred bucks, mm -hmm. another hundred bucks. You know, so I could knock out a sculpt in anywhere from eight to twelve hours. Yeah. You know, uh, do a good, good wet clay likeness, um, and so you know. But uh, as far as uh, characters, sort of what when you first end up doing something that's kind of becomes the uh, iconic part of their costume. Like I did the first Beefcake helmet, but it was Cornelius Carnage back in the day. Mm -hmm. That was first worn in I guess 86 and so uh, whoever took that character on and started wearing that helmet and it became P Beefcake the Mighty that was sort of like my territory now it's like okay I, I'm the one who's gonna do the shoulder pads I'm the one who's gonna do the the breastplate or the, the skirt or the leggings and stuff like that but not exclusively uh, Beefcake the Mighty had you know, elements that were made by other people. Like one guy made the leggings. Um, one guy made the uh, the feet. You know, um, things like that. So uh, it, it's it's a it's a it's a yeah it's a fucking battle royale to um, decide who what how you know what what sort of stuff got made. But if it was complex engineering and it was a big monster, I was usually the go-to guy. And if it was a, um, if it was a uh, celebrity likeness, I was usually the go-to guy. And um, and other than that, I did parts and pieces of other uh, people's costumes. For instance, I did the last version of Odorous, you know, with with Matt McGuire. We mm -hmm. did that together. Matt McGuire and I sculpt real well together. Um, we can work on a piece side by side. That's not, that's weird. You don't see that. You certainly didn't see it in the slave pit. You know, it's like eh, get out of here. You know, it's like uh, Matt. I never had any problem with. Yeah. He never had a problem with me. He's pretty egoless, for the most part. Um, and uh, so, for instance, we did 
the the the, the Blothar body. You know, we worked on uh, the the um, <clears throat> the new ball sack helmet that not everybody loved. <laughs> people like it smooth. Some people yeah. like it rough. I like round. No points. Yeah, yeah. So I, you I'm know one what? Of those guys. I I agree with you. Um, I get to be like. I feel like once it's reached that iconic point, yeah. that's it. Mm -hmm. You stop. Yeah. Because I see that all the time. I see War that. party jaws were perfect. Yeah, I, I, I see, I see people uh, doing that with shit like you know the Batmobile and mm -hmm. things like that. It's like adding extra ribs and fins. Yeah. No, no. Sometimes there's, less is more. There's an elegance to simplicity. Mm -hmm. And um, you know when something hits it just right, it should stay that way. I, as far as I'm concerned, that's why. Some people are bugged, but I, I feel just completely married now to uh, Sleazy being in his burgundy purple mm -hmm. costume. That's yeah. it. I don't want to change that. Yeah. I know. So why don't you go with the gold one with the short lamb, man? You know, yeah. this or that. And I was like, no, that's it. Yeah. That's him. It's been that way since '93, and uh, you know, I'm just gonna leave it that way now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with that. Going back to Sleazy's uh, unevolution, uh, I wanted to ask about everybody else has evolved, and Sleazy, arguably the most unique character in Guar, yeah. because he's a human, yeah, not an alien, just a pimp essentially. Mm -hmm. How did you construct that character? I want to know about everything from okay. the, from the look, the evolution to the accent, of it. Okay, to, sure. To just how that how that came. I to will be. I will get it from the get-go okay the character in its the basic essence of it was thought up by Dave mm -hmm. um, and uh, he came up with a character called Sluggo P. Martini uh, the first time I think he appeared he was played by Michael Moore who was helping Hunter film he was basically more like a video guy but Michael Moore was you know kind of a you know he's kind of a real overly exaggerated you know, hyper dude, you know, and so they what they did was they put a rainbow wig on him and gave him wraparound sunglasses, like a real quasi pseudo punk rocker yeah. sort of character. And you can see him on the PB Kelly's and he's just like blah, 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 blah. You know, he was just like that's a nut. And so that was just appeared to be a one off was like for that show. Mm -hmm. Then Dave uh decides to um make his friend um, Tim Herman Sluggo P. Martini for the next show. I think it was a matinee. We did a matinee down at Flood Zone. And uh, I remember it because I, I and Jim Diaz were the first slave slaves. We just threw some of these weird, we found some nets and we threw them over ourselves. And so we basically just, we were just basically helping stagehands. Mm -hmm. We were helpful stagehands, but we thought we'd kind of try to in character while we were doing it. Yeah. That character, that sort of concept started getting going but from that. But uh, uh, honestly, I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, uh, I had too much ego. That's interesting because <laughs> I've always been under the impression that Bonner was the one that He was. He was the first. Was the really. He's the one who took it seriously yeah. and made that into a character. Character. Hmm. But me and Jim Diaz, we just threw some nets over ourselves. We were just stage handing. Yeah. We didn't think of ourselves. We didn't call ourselves slaves or anything like that. The term slave or that concept really wasn't. It was just like, you know, we'll just try to look like we're in character and, and help out. Yeah. But anyways, that show, uh, Flood Zone, Tim Herman is Sluggo P. Martini. He goes out on stage to intro the band, and it's a matinee show. And he's already so wasted. He's out of control. Mm -hmm. He's out of control. He's screaming, you know, Equa! and Dave, the band starts playing, and Dave comes out as, uh, you know, in character. He comes out to get the microphone. Fucking Tim Herman won't give him a microphone. They're having a wrestling match on stage. Dave's trying to wrestle this microphone from this fucking wasted Tim Herman. It just can't even, you know, Finally, gets away from it. The show gets going. Then later on, there's this bit where uh, uh, Sluggo P. Martini is, comes out with some cocaine to get the band high. He brings a bunch of powdered sugar. Uh, I didn't even realize this happened because I wasn't looking at the stage, that part of the stage at the moment when it happened. But according to Greg Ottinger, who was playing Cornelius Carnage, uh, fucking Tim, Tim Herman throws uh, 
powdered sugar and went boom right into the pickups of the guitar. Just instantly <laughs> seizing them up, ruining the guitars, man. Uh, and um, the band, when it was over, the band was so fucking pissed off at them. They fucking duct taped them up and threw them in a trash, a trash dumpster or tr garbage truck. I can't remember which. They just fucking were outraged at him. And so, you know, it wasn't like he was fired. It was just, you're not going to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to, you know, use somebody else. And so, uh, you know, I was dying to get on stage and play something. So uh, then I volunteered to do it. And so the first show I did, the premise was, was I was Slogo P. Martini's brother, Sleazy P. Martini. And I had found out that they had murdered my brother. And I held up this, just you know, a classic Dave Brocky sculpt of mm -hmm. just a collection of garbage and, and rubber. And it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be Sluggo P. Martini after he'd been found floating in the Hudson Bay or something like that for a fucking few weeks. And uh, I hold him up and I threaten the band and tell them they work for me now. And, um, you know, I didn't fuck anything up. I did hit my lines, I hit my parts. Uh, I, was, I was helpful, you know. Um, I was able, I changed into other costumes. That was when I also did the cockroach in that show. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I became the manager. Now, if you sit there and you see some of the old, old footage from that show and, say, some of the stuff we shot around in Richmond, uh, my character was, I just took a black suit that I used to have. I had a, wore a black suit. And I just, I just painted a little mustache on it, yeah. and I just slicked my hair back. I just played the cheese ball, dick yeah. weed, weasel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I looked, I looked the part. So you know, um, and then from there, uh, I, from there, I said, okay, let me up this game, add some hair, and um, so I got uh, some just old lady wigs. I took an old lady wig and I put it on. And then I said, I need some more up here. Mm -hmm. you know, so I took another old lady wig and I sewed it on to that. And it just it was just a stupid mess. It looked just so retarded looking. <laughs> and I you know, found old leisure suits at the thrift store. And uh, I'd stuff a bunch of socks down in my crotch to make it all big and bulgy. And, uh, you know... So that was the next step in Sleazy's evolution. Then I, I was thinking back how when I was in high school, when I lived in Northern Virginia, I remember getting pulled over by a cop. I remember getting pulled over by a cop in Northern Virginia and uh, he's like, you know, telling me what I did wrong and is writing up the ticket or whatever. And I'm looking at him and the whole time I'm looking at him, I'm like, like he had the, he had that 70s era blown back disco hairdo you know it was just perfect mm -hmm. it was so perfect and I'm looking at it I was like I don't think there's a single hair crossing another yeah. one like how how did you create that perfect parallel lineage in your head man it was just you know I was like where am I it's tuning out <laughs> it was probably high or something yeah okay yes officer no officer Absolutely. Thank you, officer. <laughs> but just the whole time in awe of his hair. And so that was in my mind. And I said, oh, you know, everything's kind of getting big, you know, and guar. And we're using uh, polyfoam. So I took some seat cushions, uh, the Hunter Jackson uh, method for making stuff, and used scissors and just carved myself this, you know, what I remember that cop, an exaggerated version mm -hmm. of what I remember that North, North Fairfax County cop looking like, his hair looking like inside. I sculpted that, and to add that, you know, that look, I, I took rope. I took, you know, like, it was, I guess you would say it was uh, laundry uh, line, you know, the kind you hang up your laundry with, that's mm -hmm. thick rope, and I just laid it and made sure they never crossed. It's all perfectly parallel, side by side. And so that was the next step, and I was wearing leisure suits, finding better ones, ones that fit me a little better and looked like they were reasonably, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. And then the next step was, you know, uh, I'm going to mold and cast it. And I molded and casted one. Uh, that was the one. But I had issues with that one. That one was covered my ears. Mm -hmm. And when you had to sing songs, you know, 
you've got to hear what's coming out of the monitors to stay in tune and in, in tempo, you yeah. know. So I came up with the next version of the wig and I took it up over the ears. And, you know, Dave always told me he liked the old one better that was just, you know, yeah. like that. And I kind of saw what he, like what he, I agreed with him, but I, I had to hear, I had to be able to hear what was going yeah. on. So, uh, is that the one that I own? Yeah. Scum dogs. So I have one of each. Yeah. You have one yeah. of each. That That's one, the other one's a super rare. Cause I don't think that was about one or two of those. Yeah. The scum dogs one? Yeah. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen another. Uh, that's a Not very, the collector circuit. Anyways. I don't think so, man. I wonder if I only made one. Yeah. I might've made one and lost it or destroyed and replaced it. Yeah. And does it have little holes, kind of, no. in this, in there? Oh, okay. Uh, maybe on the inside. But okay. It's been so long since I take a look seen at it. The See, because what I did try to do is hollow out that yeah. area and cut some vents in there yeah. to try to be able to let myself to hear. So I don't yeah. know. Once they go in the heads, I don't take them back off. So right. So, uh, so yeah. And Danielle, of course, she took over the the, the costume design, and you know, you can't you can't touch her designs mm. for the the suits. Yeah. She did all those suits, the all three versions. You got one version. You got you got one version, and then you've got, you, of course, you've got kind of a an a an, an imitation of one of her designs, yeah. right? Um, that uh, updated version, but she was great at that. Yeah, you know? we crossed over. I did stuff for her. I put pieces on her costume, like the shoulder skulls, mm -hmm. and um, uh, some other things for her costume. So. I'd love to track down the uh, baby blue and the gold suit. Imagine getting that. Baby in the blue one. That's a leisure suit, right? Yeah. Good luck. It was with Scum Dog's hair, though. Good luck. I don't know where you're going to find that. I have no idea what happened to that. Yeah. yeah. What about the gold one? The gold one? I don't know what happened to that either. <laughs> God damn it, Don. I know. I know. I, it's just you get, you're with people who just don't take that sort of stuff. They don't treasure it. Oh, you're telling me, because Slate Pit's going to break my heart. Yeah, it's going to break your heart because, uh, well, first of all, it won't break your heart as bad as it could be because all that shit is crammed into plastic tubs. Yeah. If I had my way, I'd be going through those You'd plastic You'd be going tubs. every single one, pull them down, look through them. That's the ultimate uh, attic raid. And, um, yeah, if, if Matt would let you, I don't know if he will or what's going to... Yeah, we'll that's find out. Up. It's like... It's just letting money go to waste. Well, not only that, but like, I don't know. They're not going to use. Money. They're yeah. not. I know, but I they're not going to use it. it. Yeah, they're not going to use it. Yeah, they could sell that stuff and 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 get some money with it. It's okay. You want it to rot and and make no money, or do you want it to be preserved and make some money? I don't see yeah. how there's any choice there. Yes, yeah. I've heard through other members that have offered to sell certain things or whatever that they're kind of holding out for some sort of um, officiating of these items All right. uh, and I still find that strange because I would easily send you back anything that you've sold me if you needed it mm -hmm. for museum showings yeah or art shows or yeah. whatever um, I would sign a contract yeah anyways that's a whole nother thing yeah. anyways uh, yeah I'm sad about that already <laughs> so I haven't even been there yet but Whatever. Another story. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Yeah. So, Sleazy. Yeah. Fully your baby. You yeah. were the one that that crafted that from the Sluggo P. Martini incident. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we miss anything else there? I don't think you missed anything. Uh, hats off to Danielle for really taking the uh, the suit designs and, and finalizing that. That was her idea to go with the vinyl. Yeah. That was her idea to do that sort of thing. And uh, that's what really took that... To me, that's what made that character as surreal and, and, and or shall I say, as unreal as the rest of Guar. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for the wig was one dude. part, but yeah. when you see that vinyl on somebody, it reminds you. You know, a lot of people's Max Headroom mm -hmm. popped into their heads. A lot of that, yeah. you know. So um, yeah, hats off to Danielle. When was your favorite time to be in Guar, and why? Ah, oh, that's easy. That's easy. Uh, that the, the Halcyon days, which was when we moved it from out of the 801 Broad Street location, which was a somewhat smallish facility, to 2010 Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. um, 
And 20 tangible. I wonder if you could go visit all the old slave pits. Man, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. You get Matt to drive you by and just take at least some exteriors. Like, you need an exterior of the dairy because yeah. it still looks like the dairy. Yeah. It's got the milk bottles. I was going to ask if they were still standing. Yeah. You should. You no should. one talks about it anymore. Yeah. Um, but 2010 Chamberlain is when we were finally making some money. We were, getting, we were wasting our freaking uh, merchandise advances, you know. <laughs> We were acting like somehow, you know, this was gonna, the money would never stop. Mm -hmm. And so, this is the slave pit that we had from Phallus and Wonderland up until uh, uh, violence has arrived. Yeah, so it's, that was a big spot. I remember it, was a, it was a huge spot. We Kill Everything, there's a walkthrough video on YouTube, and there's just open, empty areas for yeah. days. Yeah, we had one big major room yeah. uh, where we, we built a huge green screen. That's where it's sleazy so it was too, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I had a little sleazy set there, which got used, and it was just one of the low points of my relationship with Danielle, she, she, she took my old set that I had to break down, and she painted on the fucking, my, my, my flats. I had, you know, I had these, I had these, uh, you know, uh, wood paneling flats. I was trying to go that, for that look that basically you kind of would see in a porn shop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it just seemed to throw up wood paneling and Christmas lights and crap like that, you know. And uh, she just painted over that to do her uh, Don't Need a Man video, man. And yeah. didn't ask me. I was livid. I was livid. Um, it was my money and a lot of work that I did to build that. But uh, anyways. Um, so, so the 2010 Chamberlain slave pit uh first of all the reason why i loved that era so much was because those were the funnest projects we ever worked on right all the really big fun projects we did we did uh phallus and wonderland there we did skull head head school head face there we did the uh ragnarok um you know surf of sin video in there mm -hmm. um we did um all kinds of uh, just yeah, that's just the, the best era we recorded a couple of albums there we did we recorded Ragnarok there the album and uh, uh, we kill every no, excuse me not we kill everything um, violence has arrived was recorded in there which to me is still the best sounding Guar album ever mm -hmm. but what I loved about it was was that I lived there as well and it was like it was like a art art house fraternity it's just a non-stop party yeah. and work it was just like wake up and you're in your workplace you know and you're with your friends and um you know there's always there's always uh just a party going while you're working party while you work work while you party it was just never stop we had a little cubby holes that we lived in up there we you know everybody in guar we found places to live, and what we did is we went upstairs. We went into attic spaces. Mm -hmm. It was m miserably hot up in them, so we all had to have, we'd buy a little cheap, you know, used 5,000 BTU ACs and put them in there to, to, to blast. You had to cap, crank those things on max and have the air blowing right at you yeah. to even begin to feel normal. Um, but uh, regardless, it, it was just uh, just just so much fun. I lived right across from Chuck, you know, my best friend in the band, and uh, we just we just had so much fun there. I, I, I I'll always that and uh, what came later in my life, I guess um, that and being married. Those are the two best eras of my life. Yeah, yeah. Who was your uh, favorite? cohort to work with and why it was either Matt McGuire or Chuck Varga you know they were pretty egoless yeah uh, you know it was it was you know some people weren't and some people were um, and uh, Chuck was uh, pretty egoless and so was Matt um, but for me it was Chuck because Chuck was the one I was working with heavily in that era, and um, well, we're still friends to this day. In yeah. fact, he called me last night. I blew his call off. 
uh, I was in the middle of something and I, did, I couldn't get to my, couldn't use my phone. It's like I'm handling urethane foam. That's it. I got gloves yeah. on. I can't touch my thing. Yeah. Sorry, Chuck. Sorry, Chuck. I gotta let you go. <laughs> I had to let you go. But um, yeah, Chuck, Chuck, best buds. Um, and uh, but uh, it was always a blast. Uh, you know, even even the worst of them, though. <laughs> I shouldn't put it that way. Yeah. Even the ones I got along with the least, I still had a lot of fun with. Yeah. You know. Hunter and I bumped heads, but I still, I don't know, he probably hated me more than I hated him, but it, <laughs> I still had fun with him, you know, in that era. Um, it was still, it was still a good time, but it was, you know, at the same time, it was stressful. It was, it was a lot of stress uh, in that era because there was still a lot of head banging as far as, you know, how things should go, how things should be done. You know, what made Guar the way it was is the fact that you had all these different people had kind of a different idea of what Guar was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know? Just a big melting pot. Yeah. Yeah, a melting pot of ideas. Yeah, one general concept. And then a lot of people basically saying, oh, it's, it should be a Fangoria horror movie on yeah. stage. Uh, no, it's supposed to be a Japanese live action, you know, Johnny Sacco and his frying robot you know, show. Uh, no, no, it's supposed to be an S. Clay Wilson punk rock, you know, sick, demented sex show. Yeah. You, know, you can guess who that is. Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody, and no, no, it's about women's rights, girl power. <laughs> I'm starting to figure out exactly who's doing what. Uh, yeah, you know, stuff like that. And so... Um, uh, that's 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 the only way it would have worked to, um, and that's the way it, it worked. That's the way it was because uh, Guar never had the money. If it had been like Marilyn Manson mm -hmm. or Rob Zombie, yeah. like this is what I want. I'm hiring you. You do this. Well, thank God it wasn't. And if I if it doesn't, you know, <laughs> if it doesn't work, you know, then I'm gonna let you go and find somebody who does it the way I want it. Yeah. You know. Um, you know, because of you get a bunch of people to starve, and uh, and basically punish themselves to be part of this team, you have to allow them to stick their their two cents worth in. Yeah. And everybody got their ideas in. Some more than others, but everybody got their ideas in, and influenced the way things were. You know, I remember there's stuff that uh, was added to the show I did not like. Mm -hmm. and not just because of say content or message just just the way it was done yeah just it was executed it's like oh god it's funny that you keep leading me right into my next question that that shit's embarrassing yeah. man i don't want to i don't want to be on stage with that <laughs> and i was like you know go ahead what's it you have mentioned to me in the past that dicks were never your thing yeah and you weren't crazy about certain things like infanticide, sex exploitation. Yeah. Uh, was there anything that was ever too far for anybody uh, that got vetoed out? I don't think so. No. If Dave wanted it, yeah, it was just if sort Dave of like wanted it, no one else wanted the, the weird shit. Well, it wasn't that. <laughs> blame I mean, Dave. It, it wasn't, the, and you don't blame Dave. It's just more like along the lines of this is you know, it's like I let Dave get away with this. So Dave will let me get away with what I want to do. Yeah. You know? There are certain things that I've heard uh, urban legends of, stories of, that I've never actually seen. Yeah. The the Virginia Tech shooter yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. Did that get pulled after it was I received? Know, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't on touring with them at the time. Yeah. I heard secondhand, though, the feedback. Yeah. How it was not... I can't find well footage. received. Could not find footage of that. It was not well received at uh, in the, the western portions of Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's a funny concept. Uh, uh, yeah, not as bad, say as who was I? I was just talking about him on my live show. Uh, her, um, Lacey Peterson. Lacey Peterson. Yeah, the fish with the cig cigarette in his mouth. Oh my God! <laughs> you know, shit like that. That's yeah. Dave. Dave is like she, lady die. You know, he... That's mine, though. I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that loves attacking people who deserve to be attacked. Dave, he'll like... He'll like... Uh, everybody loves this person. Yeah. Therefore, I will fucking destroy them. Yeah. 
that was Dave's kind of mentality. Well, it's funny because that's the one and only prop I've ever been hesitant to buy. The lady <laughs> die. I was like, what? I mean, yeah, it's Guar history, but like, what am I doing with this? <laughs> and it was the last thing I bought from from Chris St. Martin because I just I, I just couldn't make myself buy it. Yeah, well, you know, it's sort of, if you think about it, it's pretty collectible, I would yeah, think. Oh, yeah. It's the most offensive thing in my collection, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see her fucking vulva sticking out there. Yeah. What's even vulva. grosser than the, the vagina and stuff is the, is the neck flap. Oh. It's so, it's just a gross prop. But yeah, I didn't know if uh, maybe... I'm pretty sure Dave sculpted that, I think. Did he? I think so. Dave was a decent sculptor. Yeah. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't very realistic, but he'd, he'd hit the likeness well enough where you know who it was supposed to yeah. be. And it was funny looking, yeah. you know. So he drew, he sculpted like he drew. Yeah. Like the Pope. Yeah. And if you've ever seen the Pope in, I think it's in the uh, Blood Drive uh, War Party. Yeah, it's like a static yeah. Pope. Though. In fact, it, the, we, yeah. yeah, we put him on a, kind of this frame thing and wheeled him out there. And Last War I War saw comes was... Because uh... he, he wanted not just a decay, he wanted the whole upper half yeah. to come apart. So we had to come up with something that was uh, yeah. a frame, and Gorgor -Gor comes out, and I think he bites the Pope, yeah. his whole upper torso off. I'd really like to get that. It's uh, sitting at the slate pit rotting. Good luck finding. <laughs> yeah, good luck finding that. Yeah. I don't know where that is, but um, you know, there's stuff. There's stuff in there that has no business. Even we're not. Why are we even keeping it? Yeah. As an active Guar member for over 30 years now, yeah. oldest Guar member. Well, you know, let's just be honest. I'm really not that active anymore. Yeah, but, I mean, you I'm, do a sleazy show every weekend. Yeah, that's true. Your name is tied to the band forever, so yeah. sleazy is a part of Guar. Yeah, I'm Whether. still active as a character. Let's put it that way. How have you seen the industry change over that time, and what do you think of a modern industry? When you say the uh, industry, what specifically do you mean? Well, you're obviously more actively involved in the in the art and show side of yeah. Guar uh, rather than the music. So I, I guess just showbiz in general. I mean, you're still touring with the band with those experiences, not actively touring, but um, just show business. How has, how has... Sure are a lot of mask bands, aren't there? There are. There really are. <laughs> <laughs> that was a gay laugh. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Canceled. I tell you what, yeah, you cut that out. No gay laughs. Um... He meant happy. Yeah, um, I remember I was looking at the U I was I was on YouTube, and, and this is only semi-related, but I have to tell this story. Uh, and I think I told you this before. I was on YouTube, and it was one of those list type videos, it's like top ten this or twenty that or top ten masked bands. Yeah, yeah. it was top forty one masked bands. <laughs> Jesus Lord, top forty one. Not the bottom 41. Yeah. Or the collective 2,556 or whatever, or how many there are. But it was the top 41 mass bands. Quar came in number nine, baby. We were nine. <laughs> Who beat you? Oh, God. <laughs> I don't even remember. You can guess. I'm sure Ghost and uh, Slipknot yeah. and uh, I don't know who else. Probably Lordy, maybe, you know. Uh, cool. Didn't matter. Yeah. My fucking, my blood boiled and my face went white <laughs> after that. Yeah. And, um, you know, that is one thing that changed was that, you know, it, it feels like, it feels like bands were hesitant to do stuff like that. I think they were afraid of being perceived as gimmicky. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's what they used to say about Guar early on. They would sit there and go, you know, I wish a band just, why can't the music be enough? You know, something like that. Like, why not get a full show? Why not just do what you fucking feel yeah. like, yeah. regardless? You want to put a mask on? Fine. You want to dance around in a peanut G-string? That's fine, too. You know, it's just what we wanted to do. We weren't mm -hmm. thinking about... You know, um, gee, I hope, I hope our audience is okay with this, you know. But um, the industry, I can't tell you how the industry really has changed since, really since the 2000s. Um, 
I'm not big on, you know, I don't, I don't follow music very closely anymore, but I could tell you, for instance, one of the things like when we were on tour, uh, we would, we did a show in Nevada and we have a hardcore experienced road manager. Um, I guess I'll leave his name out of it just because in case it's somehow embarrassing because he was always giving me a little insights into mm -hmm. the, the, the rock industry with other bands, you know, real bands, not fake gimmick bands like Guar. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, he was sitting there and he was talking about, for instance, we did a, the, the, uh, this band, I think it was Avenged Sevenfold, mm -hmm. and they had just done a club. Uh, it came through town not but a few days before us, and they did half our number, you know. Mm -hmm. They did like half of what we did. Um, I think they, they they did a show and it was like 500 something. I don't know if Avenge Sevenfold's watching this, they're gonna go, no, we did more than that, or I don't know. Hell, I don't even remember fully if it was Avenge Sevenfold. It was one of those stupid band names that it's a fucking whole book title. You know how they are yeah. now, like. Blah, 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 yeah. You know, like as I lay dying. Yeah, I was. Why? You know, you're taking whole paragraphs yeah. now out of books and sticking them on there as your name. But anyways, it's one of those bands, and he was kind of explaining to me and, and talking about how um, people when 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 the seventies, eighties, and maybe the nineties, you bought an album, you had a vinyl record. Bought that album, you open it up, you look at all the art, you read all the text in there, mm -hmm. maybe the liner, it had a line, maybe a poster in yeah. there as well. You poured over it and you sat there and thought how cool everything was, and you know, things like that. And you, you like, oh, that's the bassist. Wonder what he's like. Oh, there, look at the guitarist, he's so cool. You know, I wish it was like him. You know, you. Speak you're a kid and you're you're identifying with this band. You're you're sitting there and you're listening to the record. And, you know, like all kids, I think you're you're fantasizing, visualizing yourself on stage with them, rocking mm -hmm. out. You know, like we're in the band and you know. Uh, and then and then the internet came. No the internet secrets, came. No mystery. It wasn't just that. It was the fact that basically people started like Spotify. They became just hunting peckers. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know, uh, I, just, I like this song, boop, put it in my little, I like that song, boop, I put it in my, my whatever. Um, nobody's buying an album per se, they're just hunting and pecking singles. Yeah. And so, uh, a lot of people have all this music they're listening to that they like, but they don't know a fucking thing about the band. Really, yeah. might know, might know the name of the band, mm -hmm. probably don't know what they look like. And uh, don't develop a they don't you know they don't develop an obsession with them where they even care if they're coming to you know if they're on tour or not necessarily right and so um, you know uh, there's a lot of bands out there they're they're they go platinum but no when they go out on tour nobody gives a shit mm -hmm. which is just weird to yeah. me it's just like 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 so strange that 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 would happen you know um seems like a lot of those bands they need to be part of some big festival, festival yeah and then and then and then enough people show up and they they catch them and they develop an appreciation for their yeah. act and things like that and then they get a following and they they, they are big when they're when they're on tour but um you know there's a there's a lot of aspects to why it feels like the whole why metal is dying is a there's a demographic issue going on mm -hmm. goddamn meth heads aren't having babies you know they were rocking out in the 80s and they were too busy too busy getting wasted to uh, remember to have children and then they woke up and they were 45 <laughs> it was over and they're still trying to live in high school, you know, yeah. but they don't have any kids coming up to replace those fans. Yeah. It's true. Demographics. It's like, uh, I think I looked at some chart. It was on uh, it was some little video on uh, YouTube. It was basically uh, metal popularity around the world. It was like, South Central America and Scandinavia. That was it, man. It was like, 
you know, those are the places where it was still strong. Yeah. It's just like every place else, it was like, you know, it was just, it's, it's a genre that has, yeah, it's just slowly kind of fading away. It's sorry, sad to say, sorry to say, uh, uh, you know, I and mean, who knows, maybe it'll come back, but right now I think metal is a permanent subgenre yeah. of rock and roll. You know, it's just the way it is. It's like I saw punk die. I feel like I saw it die in 1985 when I went and saw Black Flag with my friend Tim Herman, and there was like three people in that audience, counting us two. And uh, they they went to D.C. and they they called it quits the next day. They did a show in D.C. and it was just it was over. And um, you know, so you know these music genres they come and they go. And uh, what's going to be the next thing? I don't know. But I'll tell you what. I fucking hate. I like techno, but I hate their shows. One dipshit pushing a button. Any of the way he acts like he's about to do something really phenomenal. <laughs> Ooh, drop that beat. Fuck yeah. And everybody's like, oh, they're going nuts. They're all in fucking ecstasy, man. Yeah. They brainwashed themselves into thinking that they're fucking... Synth beat is, uh, you know, they're having a good time. Yeah, you know what? I like techno. I like techno uh, music when it's well done and you're dancing with a cute girl. At least I don't do that anymore. But you know, back in the day, you know, it was heading someplace. There was a reason yeah. you were doing it. You know, but uh, fuck me, man. I like see these guys and they're killing it. Why was thank you ought to know this? kept solely for Ragnarok era, was it just for the running joke of never having to do that song again? No, it was because, um, well, it was because for the most part, that was part, it fit into the con overall concept of that show, right? Yeah. The whole show was the Ragnarok album. And so, you know, he had these different stages in the album, and there were the aliens steal the, the semen of Odorous, and, yeah. you know, and uh, then Sleazy cuts a deal and backstabs the aliens and kills them. And uh, so it was saw, seen as basically just, it kind of a, it wasn't standalone ish enough, not mm -hmm. as much as Slaughterama was. Yeah. Slaughterama was always a perfect show ender. And so usually I'd be on tour and I'm, you know, I'd be doing costume changes yeah. constantly. And so, um, uh, I think you ought to know this also was the costume changes in that were, were problematic. The yeah. slaves had to put on those tight fitting alien costumes. Yeah, the onesies or whatever. And fucking, I always it used to irritate the shit out of me. Yeah. Um, they would keep their, all their junk on and it would just all be yeah. bulged under there. Yeah. It looked so bad, you know, just things like that that always bugged me, but, uh just funny when you ask the audience and half the people say think you ought to know this yeah i just never could understand a reason why so i thought it was for the joke of like nope not yeah. doing it I, wrong. I i know i know and i would sit there and think to myself like i'd like to do think you ought to know this you should because it, it, it i get what you're saying about the alien stuff take the aliens out of it you could still play that song at any yeah. point I, during I, the show. I, I suppose i suppose yeah i would love to see a think you ought to know this yeah i'm not alone <laughs> I know I mean, that song has grown on fans. They've, it's grown on fans over the years, which surprised me because uh, they weren't as overwhelmingly enthusiastic about it at first. Yeah. But as it time went on, um, they kept uh, they liked it more and more. I remember being accused of ripping off uh, the rhyme scheme from uh, Chili Pepper song. Really. What I gotta gotta put it in you. What I gotta something something's in you. And I always thought. I thought it was just. I thought I was just ripping off, you know, something like uh, uh, Sugar Hill Gang. You know, like yeah. that was just as basic a ramp, yeah. rap scheme as there could be. I thought I was just drawn from Run DMC or more like, uh, yeah, Run DMC or the Sugar Hill Gang. I just figured da 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 that's it. This is back. That's that's rap 101 yeah. for retards. Basically. And now I'm never going to not hear uh, Chili Peppers. Yeah. When I hear that song. I so. hate the Chili Peppers. Yeah, man. thanks for fucking that up for me. I <laughs> appreciate that. Do you like the Chili Peppers? Fuck no. Uh, no. 
Absolutely not. I got a patron's pick for you. I let my patrons uh, ask some questions. I think I picked the best one. Cool. This comes from Wyatt Medley. Yeah. What is a costume or prop you've wanted to make but doesn't quite fit the Guar aesthetic? Hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. Because I don't have an answer for that. Stumped. Stumped. What good. Would, what would be... You know... Um, God. Jeopardy music. Ding, 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 and you're out of time. What's your answer? Eh, eh. You know, they just put some zero. Nothing. Eh, eh. <laughs> I gotta give him something. I gotta give him something, man. You put that, you carried it, carried his water for him all the way to Richmond. Um, I'll tell you what, I wished we had, I wished we had done my idea for the flesh column in the movie. Okay. So the concept was Nick Galatine, it was, we learned a lot from him, but he was as problematic as he was helpful during the creation of uh, Skullhead Face Effects. Yeah. He's the one who helped do the animatronics on uh, Skullhead. Mm -hmm. um, I sculpted that, and I, I was my, me, I brought him, I met him in California, and I brought him into the band to uh, take our effects to the next level. And, um, you know, um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot on mold making and things from him. Yeah. But uh, he was kind of hard-headed, and, and uh, so it was his idea to build that cage with all the people on it, right? My idea was we have basically a, a giant dolly with a, a, a steel um, frame, straight frame, coat hanger style, and we have two people who stand on the platform, and one works one arm, and one works the other arm, and just kind of does stuff from inside and um, looking back on it considering the way the flesh column that was used in the live show which yeah. was way better than the one in my opinion than the one that was used in the movie yeah because it was way more mobile right yeah. it was running around at that big fucking mm -hmm. crazy teeth and you had two people in the hands it wasn't dangerous you know it wasn't like that thing would fall over and kill a bunch of people it could be operated by one person, uh, well, three, but really one for that portion. But uh, I wished I wished we'd have done my design for the flesh column because uh, we almost killed five people. Yeah. <laughs> it would have worked. You know, that, that monster, it's in the uh, movie. We couldn't move it. Really? It couldn't even roll. So it was supposed exists. to roll forward and attack, yeah. and it couldn't. So we had to basically have... We just had it sit there and had the band members rush it, mm -hmm. you know, and hope the audience didn't really notice that this thing was completely immobile. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wished I wished we'd have done uh, my idea for the the flesh column in that movie. Uh, I definitely wish we'd have done the the idea that we ended up doing for the live show for the flesh column. That'd be even better yeah. because then we could have had a monster already made we'd take out on the road and we'd have to remake the thing because yeah. that was an expensive, you know, time-consuming prop to make. So yeah. we ended up making it twice. First version, dangerous, immobile, impractical, poorly articulated, and whatever else you can think of that why it was a failure yeah. was probably there. Yeah. If you could go back in time, and give young Don uh -oh. one piece of advice. Uh oh. What would you tell him? Oh. Nothing. No? I probably would have ended up doing everything, pretty much everything the same way. Uh, I would have told him uh, not to take. Uh, not to take failures, you know, hard. Uh, and you know, I didn't, but I, I, uh, you know, life is like that. It's like there's those little battles you pick to fight, and the ones you walk away from, and you know, it's like later on you realize, oh man. That wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't worth it. Nothing, nothing of note or importance was accomplished by being in part in that conflict. And um, so, you know, had I like known, like, if, 
Like, if I knew what was coming, first of all, you wonder if you'd even do things the same way or do them at all if you knew ultimately at the end what was waiting for you. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, I can just shortcut that. I'll just go look that girl up in New York and <laughs> be in court. Yeah. You know, it's just like, uh, do something like that. But, you know, um, I, I, would, I would just to say, you know, just if I knew it was coming, I would have just like not lit the conflicts uh, affect me as strongly. Uh, as they uh, ended up doing, you know, and uh, just realize that, uh, you know, life is just, uh, life is a roller coaster, man, you know, life is a roller coaster, and like a roller coaster, unlike a roller coaster, at a theme park, the big drop is in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And each each drop in valley is like a little less, a little less, right? Because you're running out of energy as the yeah. thing goes along, you know. And um, you know, and then you're in life. You're like, ah, it's just like at the very end of the roller coaster, you know. It just sends you through that little fucking tunnel at the very end, mm -hmm. and just does a few of these yeah. kind of at the end to give you something. But it's almost out of energy, and it's like, you know, it's still fun. Even that part, yeah. in the little tunnel at the end. Yeah. As long as you like, aren't sitting there thinking and comparing it to the fucking big drop. You're making back it sound earlier. like you're about to fucking die, and it's freaking me. Well, out. I'm 62. Yeah, I'm 62. You got a lot of life left. Oh, no. thanks. Yeah. But you know, really, I've got less than 10 years. You know, probably to accomplish the things I want. You know, if I'm going to accomplish anything else, it's. You know, but I'm not going to sit there and ha I'm not going to, I'm not going to second guess my life. Uh, you know, it's no point, man. There's no point in, you know, just think of all those people who hit it big. And you think, God, if I could be in their shoes. Yeah. And then from their point of view, they're going, oh, I could have done so much more. Yeah. It's like movie stars that are like that. Oh, I never got that Oscar. Uh, you know. And there's all these other people looking at him. So I could just do that for one day if I could live that life for one, you know, minute. And then the people get there, they're like, they're already second guessing yeah. their success in life, you know. And uh, it's uh, it's kind of pointless, yeah, isn't it? Who fucking gets everything they want done out of life? Right. Who achieves the dreams they wanted? I wanted to be a film director done a couple of them. I directed a couple of gore videos. Yeah. That was it. You know. But at least I got to do that. Yeah. I got to do that, so you know. Why sit there and beat yourself up beat yourself up over uh, you know, unfulfilled dreams. It's like the best you can hope for is just basically uh, food and a warm place to shit. And some friends. Outsider looking in, I mean, it seems like you're doing all right. I, you know, you know, you seem happily married. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm in a happy place yeah. right now. Yeah. Beautiful house. And and uh, I think a lot of people don't get that. Yeah. They sit there and they're like, Why don't you tour anymore? Yeah. You know. And I was, it's just like, because I didn't love touring in the first place. I loved the fans mm. and I liked being on stage, but that's about two hours out of the day and then the rest of the time was I found it very boring mm -hmm. very unfulfilling and boring now I know there was other members of Guar who could fill up their time on the road and uh, you know and make it worthwhile somehow but for me I did not feel like drawing in my sketchbook on a tour bus Yeah, I didn't feel you know I can't sit there and put a slab of wet clay and sculpt something <laughs> <laughs> in the tour mm -hmm. bus or in the dressing room um and um you know i saw so for me touring was basically it was yeah it was 10 percent fun and 90 percent boredom and um so you know there are aspects i really liked but there wasn't it wasn't the life wasn't for me yeah you know and uh for those fans who wonder why it just i guess there's people like this think 
you know, going out on stage and having fans go, yeah, and, you know, that was fun uh, for a little But Once you've done it a few times, you begin to feel like it's like, one, it's kind of undeserved in a way, and two, it's two, it's like, it's not everything you were shooting for, you know, like, I was like, you, go, you people are cheering right now. Give me a million dollars so I can make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, ah, your cheers, uh, you know. What are you cheering? You're cheering, you know. You're cheering the fact that it's Friday night. You're with your friends yeah. and you're going to have a fucking awesome time. Mm -hmm. And you're watching your favorite band, you know. And I'm cool with that, you know. But at the same time, for me, it's work. That's another thing. You get on tour, all those people. You would run into them in every town. And you make friends with them. And that, that the best part, one of the best parts of being on tour is those friends you run into on tour and you get to hang out with them. Like, let's go to lunch. Let's go out for dinner and hang out at their house and do something fun. They take you to some place that's cool. That's great. But for them, it's a party, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's the weekend for them. And they're going to get wasted. And they want you to get wasted with them, mm -hmm. you know. They expect that. And uh, they're not thinking about the fact I'm doing this six to seven times a week. You're, I'm doing six to seven party weekends. Yeah. <laughs> oh, week. you're doing this one. Yeah, you know, you're doing this I'm one here. time. Yeah. Then tomorrow you sleep in. And then the next day you're going back to your job at Advance Auto Parts or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. You know, and you're back to normal. And uh, meanwhile, I'm going to run into somebody who thinks and acting just like you. You know, and. Uh, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, so that's why, and that's another reason why these guys get all, they get all, they get addicted. They get addicted and destroyed mm -hmm. by alcohol and drugs because, you know, you just start getting into those, ha that, that habit, you get acclimated to it and yeah. uh, it just gets worse and worse and worse, man. And, uh, man, you know, I sit there and I hear about another band that's canceled half their tour due to, what is that? Exhaustion. Exhaustion. <laughs> Rehab. <laughs> Exhaustion. Which means it's like basically they're not getting their sleep. Yeah. You know, so you go, you, uh, you, you do this thing where you do the most exciting part of your day is at 10 in the evening to 12 mm -hmm. at night. And then you load out a truck. Then you're with all these people who fucking love you and want to party with you. So uh, it's a completely ba ass backwards way, you know. Of living a life, right? Mm -hmm. It's like my most exciting part of my day is right before I go to bed. Supposedly, that's what you're supposed to do: go yeah. to bed. So you know, you want to unwind. You just went through that, and you want to at least have a couple beers and watch a movie and hang out with the fellas and talk. By the time that's all over, if you're a good boy, you're falling asleep around four in the morning. But a lot of guys are hanging out with those crazies and you know there's powder this and a little of that and uh they uh they're not gonna be able to fall asleep at four in the morning yeah you know so they're up till 10 right bus finally pulls out it goes someplace it pulls into a club and let's just pretend this is a typical band not a guar band just your average band they pull into a club they pull into the, well, often it's either the club or the motel. Sometimes the equipment trunk goes straight. If you're a big band, this equipment truck goes straight to the club. Yeah. And they're unloading at 12. You're the rock star. You don't have to do that, though we would. We would actually go and end up at the club as well at 12 and start unloading. But, um, so you, sh you know, you they, they go to the Motel 6 or whatever it is, and uh, they crash in their beds. You know, if they're unfortunately bringing some, you know, bimpses along, they're probably going to be keeping them up as, as well. Lots of sex and whatnot. But uh, so somewhere around 12, too, oh, you get a call from the label. Hey, don't forget now, we got those, uh, you know, presser we got to do and an in-store appearance we got to do. Mm -hmm. And we'll be going to the radio station, you know. Boom, 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 like three things in a row. Here, that's at one, and then one's at, you know, three or four, and then one. And then you hit the, uh, at six, it's time for the sound check, right? So, uh, at the end of all that, um, 
you've gotten two hours of sleep, mm -hmm. three hours of sleep. And so these guys, you know, they're, they're, fucking, they're doing meth or coke. And uh, they that's why they didn't get their sleep the night before. And so they're like, oh, God, I'm exhausted. i got to do all this stuff and try to be upbeat about it. Uh, I'm going to I'm, I'm need a little maintenance bump. Yep. I'm going to need a little maintenance bump so I that it. I can, you know, I can uh, function at the, the presser or something, whatever. And, um, yeah, and then, it's the, and then that cycle repeats. Now, now, you know, you know how meth is. Meth can be. If you just do a light amount, you're like not going to sleep for the next 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So, so, boom, you know, you you got that same situation come rolling around the next day. You haven't got your sleep. Oh boy, uh, how am I going to do this this radio uh, interview and 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 show energy? A little maintenance bump, you know, and you get know, bad habits like that, bad cycles like that. Boom, tour exhaustion, as it's called. You know, basically what it is is just collapsing from you know, too much drugging and not enough sleep. Yeah. Basically. Good time to say. Say no to drugs and alcohol. AJ's right, kids. Say no to drugs and alcohol. Don't Take approve. it from a druggy alcoholic. Uh, no, I wasn't really, really much of an alcoholic. But, uh, you know, happy to get out of it without any major chemical dependency. Yeah. But, uh, hey, if you need any example of why uh, that shit is bad, we got two people in the ground. Best guitarist and best vocalist we ever had. Mm -hmm. uh, just watch out. That's I'm all. Thinking, yeah, watch thinking. out, man. And all that shit they told us. All that shit they told us in those, uh, you know, physical ed films in high school. Remember those? Mm -hmm. God, oh, yeah. Just like, hey, man, want to try yeah. this? One thing. <clears throat> Dead. Yeah. You know? And it's like, doesn't happen like in that. It doesn't happen like that generally. And we'd always sit there and... You know, you mess around with drugs and you say, see, that was all a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It's just, they had to, for cinematic effect, they had to just truncate yeah. down the death to yeah. a shorter, shorter time scale. But I saw person after person just destroyed over the course of, you know, two, three decades. Yeah. And, um, what can you say, man? Yeah. Dave knew. He knew he had a problem. He was mm -hmm. trying to deal with it. He was taking, um, he was taking, uh, what you might call it, uh, he had special prescribed, uh, uh, what do you call it? Well, like a, like a Suboxone type thing? or Yeah, it was like, like a methadone sort of, it yeah. was a, it was a, uh, anti, anti withdrawal medications, yeah. you know. So he was trying, he was trying, and he kept, uh, but he, you know. Never fully kicked it, obviously, yeah. and uh, all it took was one, one mistake. And uh, god damn, you get into that stuff. The thing is, you can't trust the dosages too. Mm -hmm. Who's 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 putting it together, man? Right. It's like, uh, well, the guy who used to make my, uh, you know, used to sell me smack. It was this percentage of heroin and this percentage of filler. And then this next guy goes, hey, I'm making stronger, so more people will like my stuff. And this guy does their usual amount and dead. Yeah. yeah. It's tragic. So All stay I can away try from to drugs. do is uh, utilize my platform to to heat off people from that. So Well, I am as a as a as a former drug user myself, well, for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> as a part I am totally there with you. I, I support I support your message. Yeah. I endorse AJ's message, kids. Just don't. Just don't. Where do you see yourself if Guar hadn't taken off? Oh God! Do you even want to think about that? No, I don't. Because I visualize myself being an assistant manager at a fucking art store or something yeah. like that. You know? Yep. Who knows though? You know? Maybe I'm selling myself short. Yeah. But for one, I didn't know I could sculpt. Mm-hmm. I didn't. And it was like, what's that? there's a saying. And my wife hates this because she thinks it's the opposite. There's a saying somebody said, it's like, um, you know, the people always say, you know, do what you love, you know. And some other guy says, no, don't do what you love. Do what you're good at and then learn to love it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, 
I always thought I was going to be illustrator, want to be illustrator, uh, filmmaker, and I uh, didn't know that I was such a natural sculptor. And um, uh, I loved sculpt. I learned to love sculpting because, you know, uh, drawing is a struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, two dimensional drawing, it's a struggle. It's like, Race, erase, erase, start over again, erase, draw. Oh, it sucks too. And then you finally kind of, kind of just retracing your old past. You mm -hmm. fucking bored into the paper so hard that, you know, you can't really see a new, you know, a new design. And you have to you start off with another piece of paper and, or it gets good, but you realize you run out of room on one side. Yeah. <laughs> like, I always do that, you know, I always run out of room badly composed picture and um, you know but once I started working with wet clay and sculpting I was like this is easy and fun this mm -hmm. is one of the most anxiety it's the most anxiety free form of, uh, of, of, of any kind of creative process I've ever been involved in yeah and so so is that your favorite medium then yeah, I would be, yeah. you know, if I could just make the whole world out of wet clay and just sculpt it. Yeah. yeah the mold making is the pain in the ass. Yeah. And the rest of that, um, that's the nice thing about working at the dairy, or uh, at the slave pit a lot of times, is like, all I'd have to do is do the clay and then maybe, maybe do the, 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 the plaster application and then I could hand it off, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, somebody else would be do the rest. The, the tedious, boring parts. Yeah. Until it was time to paint again. A lot of territorialism in the slave pit. Always was. From the get-go. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's the downside. But whatever. Some people can take it and some people can't. Some people can't take that freaking, that, that kind of pressure. Yeah. You know, they just want to be uh, an esoteric, esoteric kind of artist who, who does their thing and, you know, you want to do gallery shows and stuff like that, you know, and you be on your own, that's fine. But uh, if you're part of a team and you got people sitting there looking over your shoulder going, you know, it kind of sucks. Yeah. Maybe you should change it. <laughs> you got to be able to take that, yeah. man. We always had our own way of dealing with that. It's like you can't straight up directly critique somebody. So what we do is we'd always come up with mean jokes and then let them work their yeah. way through, yeah. the, through the body politic, you know, and it would, wait till, it would get back to the person who did it, and then they would finally realize, oh, maybe, they, I, should they, change that. maybe I should change it yeah. up, because it's not just because this guy is, uh, I've got a personal conflict going with him, and he's just, you know, it's the whole group collective, you know. Yeah. We did that to Dave. Remember, remember when he went through his muto mutant space, mm -hmm. mutant odorous? Yeah, had the weird arm thing. Yeah, well, yeah. Usually, what we do is we we come up with a good nickname for shit, and then mm -hmm. that's that gets out and gets circulated, yeah. and then it changes their mind. So I I named him Carrot Patch Yamback. Yamback Carrot Patch, I think it was. <laughs> you changed it quick because oh, he yeah. didn't have it very yeah, long. Yeah, well, you know, he was a master doing it too. To call him, you know, we had we had an era where uh, we had these really bad leggings for. Um, we had these bad leggings for uh, Flattis. Yeah. And you call them you know, Captain Stovepipes. Because that's what they look yeah. like. They look like that. Or the, they had this stupid, uh, stupid kind of like, I forgot what kind of creature it was supposed to be. Some sort of... Some sort of uh, prehistoric mammal type head skull that went on. It was a mask. Uh... We were calling Tummy Gummy Bear, Tummy Bummy, <laughs> something yeah. like that. <laughs> Once he heard that, man, he dropped that piece and, you know, the redesign went through, you know. Uh, early versions of Blothar, called him a Papa Smurf because it was so much blue. Yeah. <laughs> That's still a design that struggles for me, I guess. But you, you, you like the, the but he, the changed one, the one mm. where he got the hog face, yeah. right? And much like, better. Yeah, much better. Yeah, yeah I agree. The I udders agree. got better. Yeah, everything got better. Yeah, yeah. I helped with that one. Yeah. And, um, but uh, early on, wasn't liking where it was going, so Papa Smurf was dropped. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. <laughs> 
Hey, Papa Smurf, why are you blue? It's like too much blue in this band now. What's going on with that? Yeah. We got a pustulus that's blue, and then we got a we got a, another one that's blue. It's like I wasn't big in blue. I didn't understand yeah. why blue just isn't a guar color. Yeah, to me. pustulus was cool because it was just the mask, yeah. and it stood out amongst yeah. all the earthy yeah. reds and stuff. Yeah, uh, blowthar's a bit much. Yeah, well, when he had the whole robe and all yeah. that and all, it was blue. Yeah. Oh my God. So that's how we deal with shit. You can just fucking denigrate and insult people. <laughs> we do it Perfect. behind their back because we just can't have a regular, you know, it's not like a lot like art school critique where everybody sits around and goes, so what do you think about yeah. this particular piece, AJ? Well, I think it could be a little more, you know, it's just like. Nope, make fun of it. No, just, just <laughs> quietly, just. You know, keep looking at it, and you know, generally speaking, unless you, and that's the thing, you you know, you've succeeded if nobody's making fun of you. That's yeah. all you get. That's your reward. That's your pat on the back. Yeah, that's your yeah. pat on the back. You won't hear overt insults. Yeah, you'll hit just hear. Maybe they'll be just feel, you know, <laughs> look over your shoulder. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Give me three things that we as Guar fans wouldn't know about Don. Damn. Um, three things you wouldn't know about me, wouldn't know about me. It's hard to say. It's really good. A lot of people do know about me. Uh, oh, I love stage musicals. Okay. What's your favorite I'm stage head, musical? I'm not just Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay. But I like a lot of the old ones, too. You know, South Pacific, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Guys and Dolls. Um, you know, and it's like, of course, that's always like that, like this litmus test for be, being gay. Yeah. Like, you've heard that joke a million times, oh, he's into, like, yeah. musicals. This just in. This just Don in. Don is gay. <laughs> <laughs> right here. And you heard it here on the House of Masks first. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a gay, uh, stage musical loving heterosexual. So, there you have it. Cool. And I, I'll bust into a song, man, if somebody wants to go with me and do some. It's like, uh, you know, Lock be a lady tonight. Never get out of my sight. I know the one. Yeah. So, I love that. Um, I love my dog. I love my dog so much. And when I talk to my dog, I like to talk. I, I give him the uh, southern, um, southern gay guy voice. Yeah. That's how I talk to my talk dog. Talk to me like I'm your dog. Okay. Oh, Biscuit. I love you, Biscuit. You just lay in there like that. You're the cutest little dog. I'm like doing, basically, I'm doing uh, this infamous guy. In fact, I'm in the documentary. Uh, his name was um, Dirt Woman. Donnie Dirt Woman. He's in, he's in, he's the guy who has the crabs in his bush in mm. Sleazy's Crab House. Yeah. That was Donnie Dirt Woman. And, um, I didn't realize what it was like to be catcalled as a woman. Okay. Till I would, when I would be around in the slave pit and, uh, or around the, the Richmond, and I occasionally would run into him. One yeah. time I was a projectionist at the uh, Biograph Theater, and uh, it was, well, I was on the inside. He was tapping on the outside. Bam, 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 bam. Hey, hey, I fuck your dick. I'll fuck your dick. i fuck your dick so good you'll go punch your girlfriend. You know, like that. Just like I was thinking, I'm like, yeah. And another time, I was like, I was in the, he was sitting on his porch uh, in the in Oregon Hill. Dave, I lived in the Oregon Hill. I lived in Oregon Hill. So like everybody at some point or another lived in Oregon Hill. It was kind of a white, low rent neighborhood. He'd be sitting on the porch and I'd be riding. My, I wish I was that bicycle feet. He would yell at me as I was going by. Why do you translate that to your dog, though? Uh, I don't know why. That's a so, weird energy to give so, your dog. Then I sit there and I talk to my dog like that. I use that same voice. It just stuck in my head, man. And it's like, you know. Because kind of, think about it. It's a chihuahua. And you're sitting here doting on a chihuahua. It's gay, kind of. Yeah. Sort of gay. Yeah. So I feel gay, and so I figured, hey, if I feel gay, and just, it is kind of gay, I might as well just go all, yeah. all, all, all gay. I'm with you. You know, I'm there. So I talk to my dog back there. So I love you, Biscuit. Don't ever leave me. I love you so much. <laughs> so what's the third thing nobody else knows about me? Um, not 
is it? I must be a fucking good interviewer. Yeah? Because I ran out of things to say? Because I am st- uh, got you stumped. Well, I mean, you know, it's easy to stump me because I, I, I don't have... When I don't have context, I need something to trigger memories. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I need things that tr- get, get triggered or otherwise. You should make your wife give the third thing. Oh, I don't know about that. Just have her yell at you. She'd just like go, he's a dick to me. <laughs> She's got two black eyes. She's like, <laughs> help. And, and, and yeah, exactly. Help me. Rescue me. It's like, uh, I love her so much because um, she sees, you know, that negative part of me like no one else does. You know, if someone sits there and realizes that you're um, you're venting and it's not about them yeah it's really just you and your issues and how you know you vent at people you know and uh that's why I've, that's the, that's the main reason why i've managed to stay married for almost what is it now it's coming up on third so coming up 25 years you know it's more than 25 years that's, you know the reason why that's worked is because she is strong enough to not take that sort of venting personal, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, so you know, I wish I wish I was I was perfect because she deserves it, but uh, I'm not, and uh, I I think I thank God that uh, she's so cool that she can sit there and take that crap and just go, eh, it's just water off water off her back, water yeah. off a duck, and she'll, uh, you know. She'll be she'll be cool next time I see her and you know, next time I talk to her she'll just just you know ignore it and, uh, so yeah it's really not about me though it's more about her kind that was of was fucking deep though yeah I never cry yeah well if that's kind of, if you find a woman like that and yeah um, that's that's that is a that's a major major element of attaining happiness. It's finding a good life partner. Yeah. Hard. Absolutely. Hard. I, 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 uh, people like me when they meet me, and then after they get to know me, <laughs> just, yeah. it just, I start, it's, I, it's still picky and mm-hmm. stuff. It's just little nitpicky things. Just, you know, it's like, hey, Don, how's it going? Oh, okay. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, so, uh, you want to go to see such and such? And it's like, I'll just, you know, I don't know. Oh, they suck. I don't want to do this. You know, instead of realizing, you know, I could voice it in a better way, like, you know, make up an excuse maybe. Yeah. Or, you know, I sit there and I go on a diatribe about why I hate something that's completely unnecessary. Mm-hmm. You know, I give them way more than they want to hear about, you know, why the, the latest inc- incarnation of spider-man sucks you know or something like that and you know there's a time for that and people ask your opinion what did you think and there's a time for it like when you when it's not uh, a place for that like you should realize the social situation of where where uh, people are uh, you know want to hear honest opinions and when you don't give honest opinions and I have a hard time telling the difference I like basically somebody asked my opinion and I'm just or you know they just bring something up that's mm-hmm. the thing it's not really even asking me opinion just bringing something up and yeah. then I just download a bunch of negativity on them and that that's the kind of thing you know that can alienate people over time mm-hmm. over time it alienate people absolutely thanks thank you for my thanks to my wife she puts up with that shit so I love her shout out to Don's wife yeah alright you ready to end this thing yeah you have got some stuff to plug that I'm sure that my audience would love to hear about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll send you some... I'm going to send you some graphics. Okay. Maybe okay. you can put it up. Um, but uh, I've been working with this guy, uh, Doug uh, Paskowitz, who's a, uh, a graphic artist, and I've been working on a graphic novel with him. We're in the preliminary stages right now. He started to do pages. We did some... I would say, you'd say basically some scenes that would make good posters. Yeah. And we'll be putting those up for sale, and they'll be autographed by him and me, um, and uh, we'll be selling those. And that's kind of like basically that's seed money to to kind of like basically 
get him some money for the work that's been done so far and it's been all pro bono right but we're going for a uh, we're shooting for a fundraiser crowdfunder to start in June and um, I've never done a crowdfunder super apprehensive about how to do it yeah. and how to make it work I'm worried about it falling flat on its face uh, it's kind of a sizable amount we're looking at 25 to 30 thousand dollars that's what our target is because yeah. we're doing a graphic novel it's about 100 pages long so paying him to do the work and paying for the printing uh, it's looking like it's probably 30 or so and um, so uh, working on a website to, to hype the project, but haven't done that yet. Um, but like I said, uh, we're going to um, we're going to put uh, print posters together, uh, three scenes from the from the, the graphic novel. Um, it's called Rednecks in Dreamland, and it's set in the '90s. I always it was originally started out. I wanted to make it. That was a, I had an idea for a movie, mm -hmm. and it was the idea to me is an homage to uh, '90s uh, culture in general, but metal in particular. I was visualizing having a fucking just vicious, brutal '90s metal soundtrack. Uh, but it's about these rednecks who um, I don't like saying that. It sounds racist. Shall we say, uh, agrarian white people? <laughs> yeah, now we're cultured. Yeah, now we're, we're cultured. agrarian white people. <laughs> Anyways, they live on a ranch and their their shit, their uh, cattle are getting mutilated, and so uh, eventually, what happens is their grandpa gets abducted and taken, and so they go on. A, they want to rescue their grandpa, and they team up with some other guys, and uh, they. Um, they infiltrate a underground base, kind of like the lines of Area 51, Dulce, you know. And there's, uh, they uncover all this fucked up shit, and uh, they big gunfight, and there's an A bomb at the end, and you know, crazy creatures, and uh, just yeah, cryptoids, cryptids everywhere, and flying saucers, and. Uh, you know, human centipedes and just all sorts of, you know, messed up shit. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, if it, you know, if we manage to make it, manage to get this thing funded and complete it, um, it's going to be, you know, kind of like Think You Ought to Know This come to life when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of bringing Think You Ought to Know This uh, aspect, especially that last verse, right? Mm-hmm. The Grays are waiting underground while they clone us. They got to deal with the Masons to dispose us. Um, yeah, it's it's that. And uh, when I when, back in the '90s, me and Chuck Vargo were heavy into UFO conspiracies. So we read up on all that stuff. We even went to Roswell in '97 for their 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know met a bunch of those UFO uh, writer nuts. And uh, so this is. This is uh, kind of it's a, my homage to the 90s. Think, think uh, heavy metal meets uh, 1950s Earth versus Flying Saucers. You know, think you ought to know this uh, as a storyline. But it's, 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 it's gross and it's uh, going to be um, violent, excessively violent. A lot, lot of gunplay. Who would have thought? A lot of gunplay. If there's not enough gunplay, I gotta flog the artist and they can put more in there because I'm already kind of like bumping heads about it. No, yeah, not, not violent enough. Yep. <laughs> so, so gotta have more violence, you know. So, uh, anyways, uh, pushing to do uh, start a crowdfunder sometime in June. Um, uh, I, I will I will send some JPEGs to you. Um, you can start maybe float those up mm -hmm. during the, this video just to show those off and um, yeah uh, that's the main thing I wanted and that's that's one of the things uh, that uh, I'm really happy to know uh, re reason I'm really happy to know AJ and have developed the relationship is that uh, 
um, <clears throat> he can help me promote a project like Every this because he's got that kind of reach. Fuck me. <laughs> it's work, man. It's Appreciate hard work. It. I sit there and I, you know, I sit there and I'm on YouTube and I'm looking at people, not you. I'm looking at people who have fucking, you know, these huge subscription numbers, and I'm thinking, fuck. Me. I do the same thing. Fuck me. How did you get there? Because you're not that good. <laughs> not you. <laughs> not you. I'm talking about the other people. I'm like yeah. watching them doing no, this shit. No, I'm right shit. there with you, man. And I'm like, God damn. Yeah. How'd you get there? Well, speaking of YouTube channels, if people want to stay tuned and see what's coming from you, you've started a separate account yeah. from the sleazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. Which, I, obviously, I'll link below. Yeah. Um, what What is the uh, the idea behind that? Uh, so, what did you do in the Guar Daddy is uh, just me um, alternately like uh, making stuff, talking about stuff, Guar related stuff. Hopefully, we get started getting some Guar uh, old members on there, talk about old days, everything I could think of. With my other show, you know, Live from the Bunker, the Sleazy Channel, um, I find myself getting strapped and strapped more and more for time. In fact, my 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 stuff making has kind of fallen to a degree between yeah. that working on the graphic novel and 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 and, and uh, this, this this stuff for these two channels. It's getting tighter and tighter. And trying to be a family man. Mm -hmm. You always forget how much time family man, being family man, uh, uh, affects you. But uh, yeah, I keep going to that channel. I'll try to keep matriculating interesting things over there, you know, so that, uh, you know, core fans, like those details that you ask about, I'll try to fill those in. You know, it might consist of me just opening up, say, the uh, tabletop book mm -hmm. and just scrolling through it and, and talking about stuff that I remember. Yeah. I'm sure if I look through the images and the parts in there, I could, it'll trigger all kinds of commentary, yeah. you know, about what it is uh, it was like to be in the band and what was going through our mind and stuff like that. There'll be more and more. I just got to learn. It's discipline, man. You got to have discipline to be mm -hmm. a YouTuber. People don't get it. No, People it's think hard, it's a joke. man. It's hard. I've got friends that have pipelined military they're successful youtubers now and they say that that it's on another level compared to that shit obviously they're not getting shot at but no no it's just you got to keep cranking that crap out yeah. and it's not just a question of turning on the camera too keeping your mouth moving it's it's a matter of editing that shit mm -hmm. creating the ins and outs the beginnings the ends it's like you know um yeah, just all the adding all the bells and whistles to the production that make it seem like a professional production, you know? Yeah. So we've got the graphic novel. Yeah. We've got What Did You Do on the Guar Daddy YouTube. Yeah. yeah. We've got the Sleazy channel mm -hmm. and Hyper Reels website. Right. Anything uh, else? Yeah. Uh, don't forget, though, uh, uh, those stuff is mirrored on BitChute and Rumble, especially the Sleazy channel. So if I fucking shoot off my mouth and get thrown off of YouTube, which could happen any day now, yeah. I've already got one strike. I got a strike and a half. Um, you know, you'll find me over there. I hope you do take the time to you know dig for my shit over in Rumble. I'm not doing anything exclusively for Rumble yet, but I'm probably gonna have to start doing that yeah. and build that up. Um, who knows? Elon Musk now uh, taking over Twitter. Maybe maybe I'll be inspired to start going on Twitter. But, yeah. Uh, that, anything else to say? Yeah, fucking YouTube's hard work. That's why I sit there and I go look at AJ and I go, damn. That's stupid. It's, it's, and, and, and uh, YouTube's doing a hell of a job to keep me shadow banned and down. They pull off subscribers from me. Yeah, same. Been dealing with it forever. And I don't even fucking do anything. I don't get political on my shit. I know. I think they just basically, what? They want, they want, they don't want to give up that bandwidth and space mm -hmm. to people like us. They want the people that make them a lot of money. Yeah. And they want to steer them towards that. And, oh, anything you want to wrap this up with? I appreciate you doing this for me. Uh, genuinely, as a longtime fan, and now I guess as a friend, if we're calling it that. Yeah. Um, I got no problem with that. Yeah, I just think it's it's really rad to uh, dive behind the characters. As much as we've seen all of that, um, I'd much rather see what's behind the curtain at this point. So, Well, it's been around long enough. Yeah. 
you probably have just completely picked apart everything that was in front of the camera, you know, so, or in front of the curtain, so yeah. There's yeah. Like, all that's left is what's behind the, the curtain. Yeah. Kind of for you, I would think. Well, I appreciate your time. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Good talking to you. Good luck that's tomorrow. Do it for us here at uh, Don's workspace, and hopefully I can get a slave pit video going tomorrow. We'll hopefully see how you that can works out. you know you can cobble together fifteen or twenty minutes out of that. Oh yeah, I'll be able to get it. something. So get cool. something out of that. Cool. <sighs> I was in that interview with my legs crossed the whole time. Oh, People are gonna think I'm gay. What a girl. Yeah, I'll set like this to make. You know what the shame of it is? It's like dudes from World War II back to, all the way back to the Civil War. They're all in the pictures. I prefer like to that. sit like this. I see it's the guys in the Civil War. Yeah. You know those guys are fucking badasses, man. And they were always sitting with their arms yeah. like with hands, and they put their arms around each other, like brother. They had bromance going all the time, <laughs> man. Dudes I feel now. Fun. Dudes won't put their arms around each other anymore either, man. They just all got so homophobic. There you go. <laughs> feel, it makes you feel better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what the fuck are we doing? I don't know. Um, <laughs>